Sergeant Bradley, it looks like the streaming has been engaged. The live is on, and we're streaming to the proper channel. You can start. Yes, well, sergeants, begin your recordings. You see recording started. Cloud recording is up. Backup is rolling. Thank you, Sergeant Martinez. You may begin opening. Good morning. And welcome today to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Thank you, sergeants. Um, and we'll start the meeting. Good morning. I am council member Antonio Reynoso, the chair of the committee on sanitation and solid waste management. Today, we are hearing a bill that I am sponsoring that amends the definition of a trade waste broker. We are also hearing intro number 2349 sponsored by council member Miller that would amend the local law 152 of 2018, which is the waste equity law that was passed through this committee in 2018. First, I'll talk about my bill. Uh, currently, any company performing waste audits in New York City has to register as a trade waste broker with the Business Integrity Commission or BIC. This includes companies that are not brokering deals between companies and private carters. The private carding industry largely lacks diversity, and we'd like to take an opportunity um, to have lowered the barrier to entry for this work. I believe that there is a lot of small, diverse companies that could perform helpful waste audits and work with companies to reduce their waste going to landfill. I'm looking forward to working with BIC and DSNY to make sure that, all, that we're doing all we can to allow smaller companies to enter this industry. Council Member Miller's intro, number 2349, would exempt a transfer station from permitted capacity reductions pursuant to local law 152 of 2018, the waste equity law, if the transfer station is changing their waste export to be by rail. The waste equity law passed after many years of advocacy and negotiation. Um, it is incredibly important to me that this law is not weakened. I'm committed to ensuring that the permitted capacity cuts made in the four designated districts, which are community boards, districts, Bronx 1 and 2, Brooklyn 1, and Queens 12, and that no district becomes overburdened by waste transfer stations in the future. That being said, waste exported by rail is cleaner and more efficient with less negative impact to the community than waste exported by truck. So I'm looking forward to listening to community members and advocates to learn how best to move forward. Now I'd like to invite uh, Council Member Miller to speak about his bill, but slightly before we do that, I just want to acknowledge that we have been joined by uh, Council Member Miller, Council Member Riley, and Council Member Chin. Um, and as uh, Council Members come in, I'll, I'll acknowledge them as well. So again, wanted to ask uh, uh, Council Member from Queens, Council Member Miller, to make an opening statement on his bill. Council Member? Good morning. Good morning to everyone that's out here. And uh, to you, certainly, uh, Chair Reynoso, good morning. Good morning to the other members of the community on sanitation. Uh, thank you uh, to all the you that have joined us here today. It's my pleasure to join you for this important hearing. And for those who are watching, of course, I'm Councilmember Adinit Miller, who represent 27 council district here in Southeast Queens, which is includes one of the community boards as mentioned by Chair uh, Reynoso designated in the equity law for undue waste burden uh, we have carried for the city. For decades, my constituents have suffered at the hands of environmental injustice where residents of Community Board 12, a community that is 98% people of color, nearly half of them immigrants and, 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 and half of them immigrant, immigrants. Uh, we handle roughly five to 7% of the city's waste input, uh, throughput. The cruel irony of this situation that for many of us growing up in the greater Jamaica area, if you came within a mile of Douglas Avenue, which is currently the location of the waste transfer station, our communities was, was used to the smell of Wonder Bread. 
because that's where the factory was once located. Now we smell garbage. The waste equity law sought to help limit these types of impacts in un overburdened communities. Many residents, namely in the Bronx, Brooklyn, have benefited from the more stringent guidelines and capacity reductions. Today's hearing, Intro 2349, seeks to build upon the work that was done on the 2018 law. Keep in mind, if not uh, for the, the, the work that has, as, as uh, Chair Reynoso said, uh, decades of advocacy and the work that was done on 2018, we would not be here discussing uh, intro 2349 today. When passed waste equity, this committee listed a few primary proposed purposes for its work. Among those, to quote the report, was to reduce truck traffic associated with collecting uh, and exporting solid waste in designated di districts. We note that exposure to diesel exhaust includes exposure to partic particular matter, nitrates, ox oxidized sulfur, sulfur dioxides. Uh, in addition, diesel exhaust contains air toxins such as benzene, formaldehyde, and dioxin. The waste equity law excluded from capacity reduction those facilities exporting waste by rail or barge. Today's bill, Introduction 2349, would expand that provision to also incentivize transfer station to begin to use rail to export waste, restoring permitted capacity if cuts have already been made, thereby creating incentive for waste companies to do, do better business. In this way, we will encourage the movement of waste away from our city streets, vulnerable populations. We will we also continue to reduce total truck traffic, address environmental safety and other quality of life issues associated with trucking. Furthermore, the, purpose legis the proposed legislation would require those facilities that agree to export the majority of their waste by rail to enclose their facilities and submit to monitoring from the Department of Sanitation to ensure the transition to rail. All other relevant state and city guidelines that govern these stations would remain in effect. Speaking for my community, we are at the doorstep to the busiest IBZ in the city, at Jamaica uh, JFK Airport. We share the Van Wick Expressway, the primary truck route that connects the airport to the greater New York area. Roughly one in every 16 crashes in Queens involve a truck. Nearly 70% of the commercial vehicle violations in some of the precincts are re related to trucking, truck parking. We have some of the highest asthma rates in the city in Southeast Queens and specifically in the greater Jamaica area. Detective Keith Williams Park here in Southeast Queens and specifically in Jamaica area, uh, a playground located uh, a block away from the Douglas Avenue is regularly consumed by uh, pollution generated by these trucks. And worst part, about it is that it, it doesn't have to be this way. Those waste facilities on Douglas Avenue lie directly adjacent to the Long Island Railroad. The tracks will be, could become available. We will hear today, it is their preference to be, what we will hear today is that it is their preference to be able to use those tracks to export waste transfer, particularly if we provide them with the incentive to do so. The status quo is not working. We have to do better and we will do better. I welcome the eyes of all participating today to take a good look at this bill and all proposed and the, those proposals before us. And I would welcome the constructive feedback let, to be sure that there are no blind spots. We need your third eyes, but let's be clear, we must do better. But let's also make sure that we take advantage of this opportunity to hold waste industry accountable, take trucks off the street and improve the quality of life, not just for Southeast Queens, the greater Jamaica area, but the entire city. I want to thank you again, Chair Reynoso, for your leadership, your time on this, and, and to those on the panel, thank you in advance. I uh, also want to thank my staff for, for, for the work that they have done uh, over the years in, in helping to put this together. So um, thank you. Look forward to 
hearing the testimony of everyone this afternoon. Thank you again, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I believe I turn it over to our council now. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, I am Nicola Bean, counsel to the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Nicole, you, you, we can't hear you anymore. Sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, you'll be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your question. For members of the public, we'll be limiting speaking time to three minutes in order to accommodate all who wish to speak today. Once you are called in to testify, please state your name, your organization, if you represent one, and when it is your turn to speak. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Appearing today for the Department of Sanitation will be Greg Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs. Appearing today for the Business Integrity Commission will be Commissioner Noah Janelle and Emily Anderson, Executive Agency Counsel. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Greg Anderson? I do. Commissioner Janelle? I do. Sorry, can you say that once more? You didn't pop up on the screen. I do. Thank you. And Emily Anderson. I do. I do. Thank you. Um, I'd like to remind the panelists to please stay unmuted if possible during the question and answer period. And thank you. Now you may begin your testimony. Who should be going first? I think you're first, Noah. Okay. Good morning, Chair Reynoso and members of the City Council <coughs> Sanitation and Solid Waste Management Committee and Council Member Miller. My name is Noah Janelle and I am the Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Business Integrity Commission or BIC. Joining me today is BIC Executive Agency Council, Emily Anderson. And as you know, we are also joined by members of the Department of Sanitation. Thank you for inviting us to testify today regarding pre-considered bill T-2021-7669 regarding waste audits, also known as waste stream surveys. BIC is a law enforcement and regulatory agency created by Local Law 42 of 1996 to regulate the commercial waste hauling or trade waste industry after decades of control by organized crime and rampant abuse of customers. Soon after the agency's creation, when it was named the Trade Waste Commission, BIC's jurisdiction expanded to include oversight of the city's public wholesale food markets and shipboard gambling. And in November 2019, Local Law 198 added safety in the trade waste industry to our jurisdiction. While BIC's responsibilities have grown, our original mission to remove and keep organized crime and other forms of corruption out of the trade waste industry has not changed. Corruption and bad actors still exist in the industry. In the last five years alone, the commission has denied 36 trade waste licenses or registrations, and at least 14 of those denials were for issues relating to corruption and other integrity issues, such as involvement with organized crime groups, serious criminal convictions of companies or principals, failing to disclose a principal of a trade waste company and providing false or misleading information to the commission. Most recently in April, 2021, BIC denied the license renewal of a company after its principal pled guilty in federal court to a bribery scheme directly related to the trade waste industry. BIC is open to discussions with this committee about the goals of the pre-considered bill and how to achieve them. However, given the history of the trade waste industry and BIC's ongoing efforts to fight corruption in it, 
Vic has serious concerns about the, un, un, the unintended consequences of removing waste stream surveys from Vic regulation. Under the administrative code, trade waste brokers must register with Vic. The definition of trade waste broker includes anyone who, for a fee, conducts evaluations or analyses of the waste generated by commercial establishments in order to recommend cost efficient means of waste disposal or other changes in related business practices. These analyses are commonly known as waste stream surveys. The pre-considered bill would remove performing such surveys from the definition of trade waste broker. As a result, entities that conduct these waste audits would be free from BIC regulation and would not be required to pass a BIC background check. This would open the door to corruption in the industry through individuals BIC has barred or who have never applied because they knew they would not pass muster. Trade waste customers, local businesses, big and small, would be most at risk. To appreciate why, it is important to understand how waste stream surveys work. Most trade waste customers in New York City are billed using a flat or average rate, meaning that their waste is not actually measured each time the truck picks it up. Under BIC's rules, a customer has a right to demand a waste, waste stream survey to measure the amount of waste that the customer leaves out for collection over a set period of time. Both trade waste brokers and licensees, the carters, perform waste stream surveys. Those conducting the surveys have direct customer contact and base the customer's fee on the results of the surveys. If left to unscrupulous parties, waste stream surveys can be a major point of corruption through manipulation, resulting in the customer paying a higher rate than it should. For this reason, any employee or agent who performs a waste stream survey on behalf of a licensee must be fingerprinted and provide BIC with additional disclosure, including interest and a listing of all criminal convictions and all pending civil or criminal actions to which the person is a party. Brokers are permitted <laughs> to perform waste stream surveys on behalf of trade waste customers in lieu of one conducted by a licensee and are required to represent the customer's interests in doing so. If a broker conducts a waste stream survey, the broker cannot request or accept money from anyone other than the customer unless the broker first discloses that to the customer. But there is always the risk that a particular broker will not act in the customer's best interests, instead establishing illegal side arrangements with carters to falsely inflate the amount of waste being collected. Given the sensitive nature of waste audits, BIC's ability to vet and regulate those performing such audits is crucial to BIC's mission of protecting customers. For example, after a recent BIC investigation, one trade waste broker paid a $70,000 fine for violations of BIC rules, including those re regarding waste stream surveys. The violations included failing to maintain required records, improperly collecting fees from customers, and engaging in illegal practices involving contracts with customers. Permitting unregistered entities to perform waste stream surveys for trade waste customers potentially opens the door to the trade waste industry for organized crime figures and others who lack the good character, honesty, and integrity required to operate in the industry. Unvetted and unchecked, they would have direct customer contact and set waste collection fees. BIC would have no direct re recourse in the event they engage in corrupt business practices. BIC supports finding new ways to meet the city's changing waste collection needs and appreciates that the council seeks to expand the number of entities able to conduct waste stream surveys. BIC is ready to work with this committee to find an appropriate solution that balances the trade waste industry's need for close regulation while lowering the barriers to entry in this area of customer service. We're now happy to answer your questions. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Chair Reynoso and members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Um, good morning also to Council Member Miller. Uh, I'm Gregory Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs at the New York City Department of Sanitation. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today 
on these two bills related to commercial waste in New York City. Um, while DSNY collects trash and recycling from residential buildings, more than 90 different private carters crisscross the city each night to service the city's 100,000 plus commercial businesses, driving long overlapping and unsafe routes. The private carters dispose of waste at a network of private transfer stations and recycling facilities in New York City and around the metropolitan region. This administration in close partnership with the chair and the city council advocates, many of whom are here today, and a wide range of stakeholders has supported comprehensive reforms to the city's commercial waste sector that seem, seek to rein in unsafe practices, improve sustainability, and promote fairness in the impacts and benefits of waste infrastructure and operations. I will briefly provide updates on those efforts before discussing the two bills that are the subject of today's hearing. In 2006, the New York City Council adopted the city's solid waste management <coughs> plan. The swamp is a fair five borough plan to sustainably manage New York City's waste and offer flexibility and resiliency in the case of a natural disaster or other emergency. The swamp mandates a shift from waste export by long haul truck to a system of marine and rail transfer stations spread throughout the five boroughs. And the swamp's implementation has provided New York City with new world-class infrastructure. In total, the swamp has reduced truck traffic associated with waste export by more than 60 million miles per year, including more than 5 million miles in and around New York City, and it has slashed greenhouse gas emissions by 34,000 tons annually. After the closure of the Fresh Kills landfill in 2001, almost all of New York City's waste was exported by long haul truck from privately owned transfer stations uh, throughout the city. Because of zoning and siting regulations, these stations were and still are today predominantly located in three neighborhoods in North Brooklyn, Southeast Queens, and the South Bronx. The swamp is based on the concept of borough equity, that no borough should be responsible for managing another's garbage. And it has steeply reduced truck traffic associated with waste collection and hauling in these historically overburdened minority communities. The swamp called for the creation of eight rail or barge based transfer stations, along with the use of an existing energy from waste facility in New Jersey. Together, these nine facilities make up a resilient and reliable network uh, for the export of waste. And they also create new waste transfer capacity that has allowed the city to permanently reduce permitted capacity at transfer stations in the historically overburdened communities I mentioned before. In August of 2018, city council passed and Mayor de Blasio signed Local Law 152, also known as the Waste Equity Law. Local Law 152 requires the Department of Sanitation to reduce the permitted capacity of putrescible and non-putrescible transfer stations in four designated community districts in those historically overburdened neighborhoods. Local Law 152 requires, required sanitation to reduce permitted capacity <clears throat> at transfer stations in, community, in Brooklyn Community District 1 by 50% and in Queens Community District 12 and Bronx Community Districts 1 and 2 by 33%. The law also allows for certain exemptions to these reductions in permitted capacity for activities consistent with the city's zero waste and swamp goals. It allows for limited ex exceptions for processing uh, recyclables and organic waste and for diverting construction and demolition debris for beneficial use. And it also fully exempts facilities that export waste by rail and have on-site rail infrastructure. Local Law 152 allows facilities to also request a one-time permit increase of up to 20% to accommodate future growth in capacity for processing recyclables or organic waste. Beginning in October 2019 and through September of 2020, the department implemented reductions in permitted capacity at 22 facilities that hold a total of 24 transfer station permits. In total, the reductions implemented pursuant to Local Law 152 cut permitted capacity in the four designated districts by 10,137 tons per day. In addition, four putrescible transfer stations located in the designated districts opted to reserve a portion of their capacity exclusively to process source separated organic waste for beneficial use. In total, these facilities reserved 377 tons per day of capacity to process source separated organic waste. And this reserved capacity was excluded for the purpose of determining reductions in permitted capacity pursuant to Local Law 152. In 2019, Mayor de Blasio signed Local Law 199, uh, requiring the establishment of commercial waste zones throughout New York City. The result of years of planning, 
analysis and stakeholder engagement by sanitation uh, in, close, in close coordination with the city council and uh, advocates. Commercial Waste Zones program will create a safe and efficient commercial waste collection system that advances the city's Green New Deal and zero waste goals while providing high quality, low cost service to New York City businesses. The new system is expected to nearly double the commercial diversion rate for recyclables and organic waste. The department began the competitive procurement process by issuing part one of a request for proposals in November, 2020. Part one requested information from potential awardees to determine their ability to perform in accordance to specific business, character, financial, and licensing requirements. The department completed its review of those part one responses and earlier this week, we released a list of 48 responsive proposers eligible to respond to part two. And that's on our website at nyc.gov slash commercial waste. The department is also promulgating several rules to implement the program, including rules governing customer service, operations, health and safety, recycling and organics collection, and other administrative requirements. In the next several weeks, we will publish final rules covering these areas, and we will also issue part two of the RFP to select the zone awardees. We expect the transition period to the new zone to begin in 2022 and last up to two years. The fiscal 22 executive budget, uh, which we uh, discussed at the last hearing in May, uh, provides 4 million in funding to support the implementation of commercial waste zones. This includes funding for 28 new uh, civilian staff in the coming years, as well as OTPS funds for implementation support, communications, outreach, and IT systems. We look forward to working with the city council and all stakeholders as we advance this important program to bring much needed reform to the city's commercial waste sector. Uh, now moving on to the two bills that we're discussing today. Uh, intro 2349 would, amend, would amend the city's waste equity law to create an exemption from permitted capacity reductions uh, for transfer stations that construct and utilize rail infrastructure on or near their property for the export uh, of all or the majority of waste they receive. <coughs> the exemption applies only to, to transfer stations that have enclosed structures having at least three walls and a roof and provides up to four years for the construction of the rail infrastructure. Um, as I noted before, the export of waste by rail instead of long haul truck reduces truck traffic on local streets and regional highways. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutant, air pollutant emissions, um, in particular when using modern freight rail locomotives with advanced emissions control technology. It improves roadway safety and it limits quality of life impacts of truck parking and transportation. Uh, DSNY supports the intent of this bill to incentivize additional rail export of waste in New York City. However, we acknowledge that the waste equity law was a hard won victory for environmental justice. And we understand that many stakeholders and advocates urge caution and express skepticism about potential changes that could roll back this important policy. We look forward to hearing from various stakeholders today and we look forward to working with the council, the industry and advocates to balance our goal of reducing truck traffic with important protections for these historically overburdened communities. Um, and on the other bill that, uh, that Commissioner Janelle uh, already spoke on, uh, the Department of Sanitation echoes the concerns of the Business Integrity Commission regarding removing regulatory authority over providers of waste audit services in particular, Local Law 199 of 2019 requires that awardees selected to provide services within a zone provide for third-party waste audits for their customers. These audits will provide a neutral and objective measure of the amount of each waste stream that a customer generates, and they can provide important resources and inf information about waste reduction, reuse, recycling, and composting strategies. Because these audits can be used as the basis for billing under the commercial waste zone system, we believe it is important for the city to retain some level of regulatory authority over the individuals and organizations conducting these audits. DSNY plans to publish draft rules in the coming weeks regarding these third party waste audits. And we look forward to receiving additional feedback through that rulemaking process. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning and uh, Commissioner Janelle and I are now happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, and uh, the, the, the great thing about Zoom is that we can have people here in real time, uh, which means that 
I'm going to ask a lot of questions. I traditionally don't ask many questions um, to allow for council members that are here to ask questions, be, you know, and, and not have to wait here uh, an hour while the chair goes through it. But I think it's going to be very important that we do do this thoroughly. But also the advocates are going to speak um, and the, the, the waste hauler is going to speak as well. And I would like to just ask uh, um, whether or not the two of you can stay on and maybe answer questions in real time or confirm things in real time. Um, I think that's gonna be important because you just made your, your, your opening statements. We'll hear the company make their opening statement. And I just wanna make sure that if they're referring to anything you said or to anything you believe, that you can respond in real time. So I just wanna make sure that uh, Commissioner Gano, um, and Greg, if you could stay on uh, as long as possible. Um, thank you. So uh, I wanna start with intro 2349 um, or 2349. Uh, do you think that the legislation is aligned with the goals of the original waste equity legislation? So I think in general, yes, I think that, that the waste equity legislation specifically included an exemption for uh, rail export um, that was included in, in some way, shape or form in every version of the predecessor bills um, and introductions, intro 495 A, B, C, uh, intro 157 A, B, C, uh, which you know, we, we spent a long time working on. Um, and I think that, that it's clear that rail export is preferable to to export by long haul truck um, for several reasons. Um, so, you know, for that reason, as I mentioned, um, we think that we, we support the intent of the bill and, and we support additional waste export by rail. Yeah, that's, a, that's extremely important. Um, just to, for reference, I guess, uh, exporting by rail, by barge was something that we really wanted to push um, as, a, as a council, as an agency, as an administration across the board is just moving away from these large trucks that were barreling through our streets was a big part of, well, you know, the work that we did with the Swamp Plan, um, with the commercial waste zones. Now, are also going to be encouraging the export um, of of trash outside of trucks, um, and <clears throat> the Waste Equity Bill did the same thing. Um, but can you speak more uh, concretely to what the benefits of exporting waste by rail are? Um, so that I just want to make sure. Like it is my impression that rail is a more sustainable or just a better way to move trash than any than than trucks. And I just want to, from your expert opinion, um, what are those benefits, um, or am I mistaken? Yeah, no, I think there there are very clear benefits. Um, and to elaborate a bit on what I mentioned in my testimony, you know, those those start at sort of a high level of greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction. Trains are just more efficient than, than automotive transportation on roads. Um, that's why public transport is more efficient than individuals driving cars. Um, there's also reductions in uh, other air pollutant emissions, things like particulate matter um, and, and other emissions that can cause uh, asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Um, in particular, when uh, railroads are using efficient and um, and advanced locomotives, um, like the one that uh, New York Atlantic is using in uh, North Brooklyn today. Um, and we, you know, I think we do want to acknowledge that there, there are some concerns out there about rail export, particularly of uh, C&D residue in open gondolas. Um, the sanitation department firmly supports uh, fully containerized uh, rail export. Um, and we, we do prefer that method. And for addressable waste that's required by, um, by the New York State DEC. Um, and then there are other benefits as well. There's no, uh, there, there are no idling long haul trucks. There's no parking of long haul trucks in, in residential neighborhoods illegally or overnight illegally or detached trailers. Um, you have far fewer safety concerns, um, particularly, you know, the, the streets I've, I've been in, in uh, Q12 in Jamaica dozens of times, and, and I know those streets very well. Um, they're very narrow. They're not easy to, to traverse, even in you know, one of our trucks, much less a, a tractor trailer. Um, and so there's clear public safety uh, implications there as well.
in this legislation, there's a uh, there will be there's a request to expand capacity while building out the new rail connection. Um, uh, I guess this is a, a question that I think can answer itself, but would that create new environmental hazards or would increase that burden um, on this community temporarily? So yeah, I, I think you answered your own question, Chair. Um, yes, for the four year construction time period that would increase the amount of waste that they could export by truck. Um, you know, I think we're we are understandably skeptical of that particular provision, but we have heard, um, and I think it's it's fair to say that we all understand that we're we're talking about one particular proposal when we talk about this bill, and that's a proposal in Councilmember Miller's district um, that he mentioned previously, and it's it's our understanding from uh, the companies that are proposing that project that in order to actually secure the financing to build this, because building new, new rail infrastructure in New York City is not cheap, we've done it, we know, um, that they, they need that additional capacity in order to actually finance the project. Um, I'll let them speak to, to, the, to that sort of concept. Um, financing of, of rail infrastructure isn't really my forte, but that's my understanding. Okay. And <clears throat> Okay. And um, in the legislation, do you feel that there is, uh, we've secured or have taken advantage of ensuring that they actually make a switch from, you know, truck to rail? Uh, do you feel confident that the legislation has safeguards in place that'll make it so that we'll, we'll reach our end goal here to actually have the trash exported by rail? I feel confident that if at the end of the four year time frame allotted in the bill that the majority of waste is not being exported by rail, the Department of Sanitation will very swiftly act to reimpose permit reductions uh, on the transfer stations that take advantage of this. So, so you feel confident that the legislation in its worst case scenario will um, return the uh, capacity to what it is now should they not be able to complete this work? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Have there been any mitigation strategies considered to reduce the negative effects of increased transport by uh, of waste by rail? I guess since we've been doing it, since the city of New York has been a big proponent of it. Um, there could have been things that we overlooked initially when we were implementing the work or wanting to, to move away from trucks to, to, to rail. Um, have there been new, uh, uh, just new strategies that have been used to, to do better, I guess, by rail to continue, continually improve our, our goals for, for limited emissions? Yeah, so I think there, there are definitely steps we can take, and, and that's true about rail. It's true about the, the tugboats that are, um, that are hauling our barges from our marine transfer stations. You know, there, there are still, let's, let's be very clear, there are still emissions from trains and boats. Um, and in some cases, the very localized emissions can be um, comparable to very localized truck emissions. That said, the overall emissions from rail and marine transport are far lower, and it's, I think, very important that we continue to focus on investments in cleaner methods of transportation. So as uh, more advanced locomotives are available on the market, we should be investing in those. We've, as I mentioned before, we've, been, we've worked with New York and Atlantic, with waste management, um, with the federal DOT and others to invest in uh, a state-of-the-art locomotive that hauls uh, containers out of the waste management facility in North Brooklyn. Um, I think we would wanna see continued investment in those kinds of uh, advanced locomotives to continue to reduce uh, both greenhouse gas emissions and other criteria pollutant emissions. Um, that's what we plan to do with uh, our marine contractors as advanced, as more advanced tugboat uh, engines are readily available on the market and uh, required by the EPA and others. We expect our contractors to use those. Uh, can we enforce that? with this legislation and this contract um, or uh, what the what the locomotive looks like is 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 that solely dependent on on the hauler 
Yeah, unfortunately, that's that's solely dependent on the hauler and and without going too far down a road uh, that I'm not an expert in, I believe that there are some federal uh, preemption concerns about about regulating uh, even short haul uh, railroads. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and now, <clears throat> I, frankly, do you believe that the project proposed by Royal can be achieved in the proposed timeline? Um, I think it's possible um, as someone who has worked in the past with the Long Island Railroad. I understand that they're uh, a slow moving organization. And so I think there is certainly an uphill, an uphill battle in terms of, of getting it done um, in a four year time frame. But I think it is technologically possible. Technologically possible. Can you put a, can you put a more, a more concrete uh, and can you just answer it more more concretely? I just want to know, um, you know, anything is possible, Greg. I, I come from a place where, you know, dreams can be achieved, but we're not talking about a dream here. We're talking about a very technical thing that needs to be done within a, a real timeline. If not, I don't want to enter into a venture where, where we know it can't happen and we're just giving them four years of, you know, permitted capacity increase. Um, I think Councilmember Miller and I really want to know that this is going to happen. We want to be back here in four years and know that it's going to happen, not, not just expand capacity temporarily on a project that is, is, uh, is a pipe dream. So yeah, I think to speak more concretely, yes, I think it can happen, but I think there, there are opportunities for roadblocks along the way. There are um, state authorities involved, there's the New York State DEC involved, there's federal regulation regarding railroads. So I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of complicated pieces to this project. I think it can be done. Um, but I, you know, I am in no way going to guarantee that it will be done in four years, because that's well beyond my purview, and our, and our purview as a regulator of just the transfer station itself. So in the legislation, I believe there's a three years with a permitted capacity increase. And then after that, there's an, a, a six, every six months, there is a, there's like a, a checkpoint um, thereafter. Uh, so if there is not a, if the project is not progressing in good faith, um, I guess, <clears throat> DSNY has the authority to cut the capacity in year three um, and and I might be I might be wrong, and maybe you could clarify for me. Um, but I just want to know: Do you feel like with this legislation, you would have the capacity to assess this project as it progresses to determine if the companies are actually making good faith efforts to complete the rail connections? Yeah. So I I believe uh, the the way that the bill, at least as introduced, is written. Um, requires that the transfer station submit a project timeline um, and that project timeline may not exceed four years. If the project is not delivered on the submitted timeline, then at the end of the, the timeline, presumably after a four year period, um, the, the permit capacity reductions are implemented again automatically um, and they stay in place until the transfer station exports all or a majority of its waste for a period of one calendar year. So should they fail in the four year period, they lose their capacity increase. And then after that, they can continue to build their project as of right. Um, and then with no capacity increase, should they finish their project, they would have to do one whole year of export by rail or show that they've done that for a year, still with no capacity increase, and then they could, I guess, submit an application or submit a notice to you that they've accomplished a year, a year's worth of work under the, the reduced capacity for them to be considered for the increase? That is correct. Okay. Um, can you speak to the challenges of connecting to a rail spur? Um, as you know it, I guess, with the work you did with the waste management facility in North Brooklyn? Um, yeah, so I think there, every site has different challenges um, based on the operator 
of the, the railroad based on the location, based on the proximity to the active rail line. Um, for example, in, waste, in the Waste Management Brooklyn facility, um, there's actually an easement behind the facility um, and the containers are drayed off street to the, the yard where they're actually put on rail cars. Um, the waste management facility in the Bronx um, has rail access directly on site. So does the one in, in Long Island City, Queens. Um, so it, it really depends on the location. Um, it's my understanding that in this location, even though it is adjacent to the Long Island Railroad mainline, um, that the track that is closest uh, to these facilities actually is not electrified. So it's not an LIRR uh, passenger service track or revenue service track. Um, so it would probably be, would certainly be less complicated than if they were trying to interfere or trying to build around LIRR revenue service. Um, so, you know, I think there, there are factors of this location that make it um, more complicated. There are factors that make it less complicated. Um, I can't speak to, to the, the very specific um, project uh, at hand here and what the timeline would be. Okay. Um, I, I have other concerns that I want to take offline. Like I, I thought that there was a provision in the legislation and I could be wrong and that could be my fault that allowed for us to, to have a conversation or know, note the progress being made and be able to move forward with a rejection or reduction of permitted capacity before the four years. But um, uh, am I wrong there, Greg? To, that, there's a, that there's an opportunity to reduce, to bring the capacity back down to, it, to what it is now earlier than the four years, um, should we see no progress or uh, a progress that's just uh, unsatisfactory? I don't believe that that is in the bill uh, intro two, three, four, nine as written. I think that's something that we'd be happy to, to discuss with, um, with you and with the sponsor um, in, in more detail. Okay, so um, speaking of the sponsor, so um, yeah, I think we do wanna have that discussion, Greg. So I wanted to just be able to do that um, offline here is something that I think would be meaningful. Um, uh, yeah, cause if there's, you know, it's fine. Uh, we'll talk offline. Councilmember Mill, I wanted to know if you had any questions for the Department of Sanitation. I wanted to make sure I could call on you. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Nicole Bean, where is she? Um, I'm going to have, yes, I'm going to have committee council call on uh, council members related to, well, actually, let me uh, go through a couple of questions for uh, my intro, because um, uh, Commissioner Gennell is here. Um, even though we love seeing you on camera, we wanna make sure you're working. Um, get those tax dollars to, to actually mean something, right? Uh, Noah, uh, so I just wanna know, so you think, do you think that companies who are performing waste audits while not brokering agreements between haulers and companies need to be regulated by BIC um, at all? I do, and for all the reasons stated in my testimony, yeah. I do. Uh, um, you know, Oh, the waste audit process is a sensitive point of uh, customer contact in the industry. And that, you know, back in the day before the Trade Waste Commission was established in 1996, and, and the entire reason that the Trade Waste Commission was established, or one of the main reasons, was because uh, customers were being uh, abused in the, in the industry by organized crime and other criminal elements that, that controlled the industry. Um, the waste stream survey or waste audit process uh, is very sensitive because those who are conducting the audits have direct customer contact and ultimately will fix the rate for you know, the fees that the, the customers pay. And so um, there are, there's, uh, in, in, in conducting these audits, it generally happens at night uh, because they're measuring the waste uh, at the time that it's being picked up. And so it's more difficult for customers to be there to monitor it. Uh, and even if a customer is monitoring it, I mean, we've seen, I've seen schemes in my career where uh, there may be a customer standing right there, but uh, a, an unscrupulous person may be able to manipulate the count. And so, uh, 
you know, we, we fully support a discussion about lowering barriers to entry to perform this kind of service. But at the same time, I do think that anyone conducting uh, these audits need to be regulated by BIC so that BIC can vet the people who are having this customer contact in the industry and try and keep those criminal elements that have been extracted and continuously try to get back in, keep them out. Thank you for that, Commissioner. But do you understand the intent of the bill and, and what we're going for here? At this point, we've made it almost impossible for new players or you know, mostly you know, minority or women-owned businesses to be able to enter into this market because of, of the barriers that have been created. And we really want to diversify the work that we're doing across the board in the sanitation um, world or field in New York City um, and want to have a more, a more reasonable conversation about breaking down those barriers. So I'm more than open to having a reasonable conversation with you. And given your opening statement, now I do fully uh, understand where you're coming from on this. And uh, you know, diversity in the in the industry is a laudable goal and one that I support. And so uh, I'm open to having that conversation and to working with this committee to uh, to see how we can help reach that goal. Have you have you thought? Um, you know, before coming here, before our discussion um, that we will have to, to really try to achieve these goals. Are there other things that you thought might be possible, to, uh, you know, barriers to entry um, and how we can how we can reduce those um, ahead of our, 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 our shared goal uh, meeting uh, to, to get to our shared goal? Well, I will I will certainly be giving it, you know, a lot of thought immediately. And when we when we receive the pre-considered bill, we uh, we started working to respond to that and to prepare for testimony. And so, you know, like I said, I will, I will meet with my team and continue our discussions. Uh, we certainly did start discussions and um, we will continue to, to discuss those goals. Well, Commissioner, I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, I feel like with your opening, your opening statement and this discussion, we've just had that there is a, there is an understanding of what, you know, the actual intent of the bill is, and there's some shared goals here, and I'm looking forward to, to having a conversation with you thereafter so that we could get to a place where we, we might both be on the same page and agree on legislation that might be helpful here. Terrific. Thank you. Um, so uh, committee council, I uh, wanna allow for council members to ask questions. Um, and I'm looking here, council member Gennaro is here as well. I wanna acknowledge that he was present. Um, let me just make sure. I've gotten everyone I have. Um, so thank you. Take it away, committee council. Thank you, Chair. Um, if council members have questions for the administration, please use the hand raise function. Now um, we'll begin with questions from council member Miller. Thank you so much. And, and again, thank you, Chair Reynoso, for, for your leadership, expertise, um, uh, and guidance and, and, and you asked all of the, 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 the really relevant pertinent questions here. This one, a, a, a little bit of follow up here. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, um, and, and you talk about the process of actually uh, facilitating the waste for trail and, and uh, race to waste the rail and what that build out process looks like. Um, have you, and, and, and so we're gonna rely on your expertise uh, and doing so and, and what you've seen throughout the city. Have you, in, in, in your opinion, seen, had the type of not just community input, but in, in, uh, the input from, from, from elected within uh, uh, the various bodies that, that would uh, be impacted by this, um, uh, as in the council um, and, and the support that is, and that you've seen from uh, uh, state, and, and, and federal uh, colleagues um, around these issues here. Um, obviously, uh, you talked about the MTA and and uh, uh, one of, one of the one of the uh, my colleagues supporting this bill is 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 the chair of 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 corporations on the state side, which governs MTA and and, and certainly uh, would weigh in, has weighed in um, to make sure. Uh, that this is happening, but um, that is if, in fact, 
um, we ran into a problem there. I don't think that we're anticipating that, considering that this is that has been negotiated. But um, you know, I, I, I don't I, I don't want to influence your, your 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 answer to that. But my my question is is um, have um, is this outside of just the process, the process flowing along, uh, uh, or is this has there been the type of community and uh, and uh, government involvement in uh, the waste and rail uh, projects that have existed uh, prior to this? Sure, thank you for that question, Council Member. Um, and I think you touched on a few different points um, that I want to make sure I react to. Um, so if I don't cover any everything, just remind me after I'm done. Um, so as far as community input, um, the existing uh, export of waste by rail facilities, um, which are the, the three waste management facilities in the South Bronx, uh, Long Island City, Queens, and uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, uh, as well as the, the city uh, run Staten Island transfer station, obviously on Staten Island. Um, those were all uh, components of the city's solid waste management plan, which was the subject of intensive uh, community uh, engagement, um, hearings, uh, extensive environmental review. It was subject to a vote by the New York City Council um, and was passed in 2006 by the New York City Council um, overwhelmingly. It also uh, was subject to review by the New York State DEC. So there was those four facilities had a lot of, of community engagement, stakeholder engagement um, before they were um, put in place. Uh, the, there is no sort of clear process and, and clearly outlined process for community and stakeholder engagement um, for future uh, projects, particularly private projects. Um, but there are some uh, minimum standards. There's environmental review that's required for any uh, change in um, in transfer station permits. And I think you know what what we've really focused on at Sanitation, particularly um, in the last seven years or so, and, and I think Chair Reynoso can attest to this, is really um, working with communities, working with advocates, working with stakeholders to understand uh, concerns, to understand um, what their uh, you know, what, what communities are sort of seeing and feeling on the ground and to make uh, decisions based on that. Um, and so I've personally met with, um, with community uh, representatives in Southeast Queens multiple times um, with advocates, with um, residents. And, you know, we've heard, we've heard their concerns. I think we, we try to be responsive to them from an enforcement perspective. Um, and, you know, we, we do what we, what we can with the resources we have. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we would keep that commitment going forward. Yeah, I guess what my question was, you know, with, with the impact particularly of the stakeholders, would, would, would that help or hinder uh, the advancement of the project? Well, you're talking about agencies that, that may uh, have, you know, listen, this is the minutia of government that we deal with on a regular basis, particular MTA, um, but, 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 but considering that we have folks, have we had, you know, ha have we had uh, individuals that have had to, stakeholders that have had to weigh in, in in the past, or was it seamless? And if in fact that has been the case, does having the support of, you know, of, of, of the folks that are mentioned that have signed on, particularly the, 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 the chair, um, uh, would that in your opinion have an impact on facilitating yeah, absolutely. I think having having the support of local community leaders, of elected officials at all levels of government, which I understand um, this project has support from a variety of elected officials, um, at least uh, the support letters I've seen. Um, so yes, that that can certainly only help um, advance the project and and make sure that that if it does hit any roadblocks at the city, state, or federal levels, that those roadblocks can be overcome quickly. Um, so, so you know, uh, Chair Reynoso, and 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 uh, in his introduction and his question to the to the commissioner, you know, uh, he, he alluded to in enforcement, and and quite frankly, everything that we do in terms of public policy and what we pass here is is ultimately comes down to enforcement, and and so we have some questions about that, and and in the past, how how, how is waste 
uh, equity law, how, how has it been uh, enforced and, and how are the provisions of the law governing waste transfer stations enforced? Namely, um, like for you to, to address the issue of, of truck uh, island and, and perhaps me, even more importantly for, for Southeast Queens, uh, truck street parking. Sure, absolutely. Um, so we have uh, what's called the Permit and Inspection Unit, PIU. Um, it's a dedicated unit that just does uh, inspection and enforcement of transfer stations. And at a minimum, uh, they're visiting every, uh, every putrescible transfer station at least once a week, um, every uh, CND transfer station at least twice a month, as well as um, much more frequent uh, drive-by or, or sort of um, you know, quicker inspections. And they're, they're really looking for a wide range of, of different things related to operations, related to quality of life, related to public safety, um, things like dust control, things like uh, um, odor control, um, uh, compliance with um, operational requirements, compliance with uh, the actual permitted capacity itself. And we issue um, you know, pretty substantial violations. Uh, they start at 2,500, they go up to $10,000. Um, and in the last uh, three years, to, to just the three facilities, or actually two facilities located here in, in Queens 12, we've issued eight violations. Um, so, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in, in violations. Um, we also do a lot of truck enforcement, as you mentioned. Um, so just this year so far, 26 um, either parking or traffic violations issued to trucks um, last calendar year, um, or actually over the last three calendar years, close to 400 total uh, violations just in Queens Community Board 12. And these are for things like detached trailers, um, commercial commercial parking in residential areas, missing plates, um, driving the wrong way uh, on a one-way street, um, uh, loose cargo, um, you know, not having the proper inspections or registrations um, and those sorts of things. So, yeah, and, and, and I, I think for, for, for CB12 and members of the community like myself that, you know, we, we, we've actually uh, passed uh, several truck, uh, commercial truck um, uh, parking uh, legislations over the past couple of years and, and, uh, and uh, to, to help enforce that and, and how readily, uh, uh, how often uh, is that enforcement? Do we can we see that enforcement? What are your inter agencies' uh, 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 coordinations and partnerships look like? DOT, NYPD, because um, because quite frankly, um, I, we would submit that that is uh, woefully insufficient by what we see uh, parked on our streets. And as I mentioned in my opening statement, our proximity to to JFK, the largest IBZ. Uh, and 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 so forth, but but um, focusing specifically on those associated with waste transfer, what, what is that universe around? Do, do you go a mile outside of the stations and and, and kind of looking, or what what does that look like? So we will, um, I think, two two different things. First, we we generally focus our enforcement in the vicinity of the transfer stations and where we know the transfer stations uh, and, and the trucks that they use um, generally park. Um, we do respond to any 311 complaint regarding a, a waste hauling vehicle. So if, if that happens a mile away, two miles away, we will respond to that complaint and, and take any necessary action. We also do have um, our larger sanitation police force, which works um, all across the city uh, doing uh, both truck enforcement as well as illegal dumping enforcement and things like that. If they witness a violation, they'll write the violation as well. Um, and we regularly work with NYPD. Obviously, they have a much uh, larger force in terms of their just personnel that can issue these violations. Um, they also have a much wider range of, of things that they're sort of focused on. Um, but when we, when we do have a sort of uh, increase in violations that we're witnessing, we'll, we'll ask the local precinct uh, for their help in terms of... Um, cracking down on, on those problems. Thank you. And I, and I certainly agree with you, more enforcement, always better um, yeah, in this situation. That, 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 that's just the problem. We, we're inundated with, with, with overnight truck tra uh, parking. And, and then- Councilman, look, Councilman Miller, very quickly, I just wanna make sure people know that when we talk about enforcement, this is, uh, this is a department of sanitation. This yep. isn't other 
agencies in the city of New York that mm -hmm. lack uh, the skill or the talent to actually make it happen, DSNY doesn't play games. So whatever we do in an enforcement portion of it um, is actually something we can feel confident will happen. They talked about having people that to work weekly and in worst case scenario, twice a month. I don't think you get that, you get anywhere near that um, uh, anywhere else in the city of New York. So you know what, you're, you're absolutely right on that one. And but you know, I, I think for for the residents of Southeast Queens here that that's on in the room now, just wanted to kind of draw a picture um, from from what we see, and 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 I, I appreciate that. And then finally, you know, I I, I know that uh, you testified that DSMY was was in favor of the rail and have been since the 2013 testimony and and. And and the work that was done uh, uh, on on uh, on this legislation, um, what would be any concerns that you would have in in uh, in in this uh, current project uh, moving forward? And, and 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 you know we've had we've been in conversation probably the last two years over this our our specific offices and 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 those concerns have been uh, hopefully put into this legislation. Um, but do you have any other concerns that that uh, could be addressed or that should be addressed uh, as we move forward? Thank you, Council Member. And I think that the the biggest lingering concern that I would have is is the one that Chair Reynoso referenced earlier, which is that you know if if substantial progress is not being made, we don't necessarily have anything until the four year period elapses to reimpose the restrictions. Um, that said. After the four years, there is a pretty a pretty aggressive uh, fail safe in the bill that would re not only reimpose the restrictions but keep them in place until the the transfer stations export their waste by rail for a year. Mm -hmm. um, so that's I think a, a pretty rigorous fail safe that we would be able to use um, if the project were not completed on time. Okay, because I, I know that 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 the chair and and others that we had talked about benchmarks earlier. Uh, uh, in, in, in the conversation, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just looking forward to continuing here. Uh, what what advocates and 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 what others, uh, and certainly what the companies have to say, and uh, so that we can uh, move forward. But I, I thank you all so much, Chair. I thank you for for entertaining uh, uh, my questioning and and really for your insight and this hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Um, and now uh, I think. Uh, Council, we're going to go to uh, the advocates now, or just, I guess, testimony um, from, from any, I guess. Yeah, we, we can move away, to I public guess. testimony exactly. um, as long as there are no other council member questions. I don't see any hands raised. Um, so now we will turn to public I, testimony. I do want to acknowledge Council Member Cabrera. I apologize. Uh, council Member Cabrera was also with us. Thank you. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I'll call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and you'll have to accept the unmute, and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before beginning your testimony. I would also like um, to we'll acknowledge we were joined by Council Member Felice as well. Great. We will begin public testimony with Eric Goldstein, followed by Caroline Susla, followed by Natasha Bynum. Starting time. Good morning. My name is Eric Goldstein, and I'm New York City Environment Director at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning, Mr. Chairman. NRDC strongly opposes Intro 2349. It would add more trucks and more waste to an already overburdened environmental justice neighborhood, and perhaps more. It would reverse promises made to the environmental justice community and it undermines trust in the city council's negotiating process. 
it would conflict with the goals and objectives and the actual language of the historic waste equity law 152 and it would represent nothing more than a capitulation to a small group of private industrial waste haulers in 2018 the city council passed what became local law 152 the waste equity law was designed to address long-standing issues of environmental racism in the siting and operation of land-based transfer stations it required dsny to reduce the permitted capacity of putrescible and non-putrescible waste in four of the city's most overburdened communities 33 percent reductions in bronx one and two in queens 12 50 percent reduction in brooklyn one the law provided a narrow exemption to the permitted capacity reductions if the facility was already exporting waste by rail and if it had on-site rail infrastructure. Implementation of the law began in October 2019. The law's provisions were not lightly decided. They were adopted after years of negotiations, going back to the Solid Waste Management Plan of 2006. After many stops and starts and following continuing engagement with environmental justice advocates in the affected communities, city officials hailed this law. For too long, a few committees, uh, communities have been saturated by waste transfer stations, said Mayor de Blasio, resulting in truck traffic and we're creating a more equitable city by shifting the burden away from these communities, he said. Speaker Johnson said, North Brooklyn, the South Bronx, Southeastern Queens have for generations been dumping grounds for the city's waste. This law will place a limit on the amount of trash that may go in and out of these neighborhoods that for years have taken an unfair burden. But now intro 2349 is being introduced as if none of this history existed. The bill reverses the mandate of local law 152. It would require the commissioner to restore reductions mandated by that law over just two years ago if a transfer station expressed the intent to export by rail in the future and constructed a rail yard, a rail link years down the line. This attempt to gut the requirements of law 152 should be rejected by this committee and the full council. Indeed, it's hard to imagine that this bill is even receiving a hearing when critically important waste legislation, such as proposals to require citywide universal composting collection for all city households, have not moved forward or haven't even had a committee hearing. What passage of this bill would allow, even if the rail links are ultimately constructed at some point in the future? is more trucks going into Queens 12 and potentially other neighborhoods and more waste coming into this already overburdened community. This would be a grave environmental injustice. It would reverse for this neighborhood much of the promise of local law 152. Such exceptions to the statute were considered and rejected just two, two and a half years ago when the details of local law 152 were being negotiated. The rail transport exception in that law was carefully considered and painstakingly negotiated. The waste industry should not now come back to renegotiate and undermine this environmental justice statute. We strongly urge the committee to reject this anti-environmental justice bill. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Caroline Kufla, followed by Natasha Bynum, followed by Meredith danberg Ficarelli. Start in time. Good morning. Uh, my name is Caroline Susloff, and I'm a legal fellow in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, or as we call it, NILPI. Um, NILPI works with communities across the New York City area, providing support and services to combat inequalities, injustices, and infringements on civil rights. Our environmental justice program has advocated and litigated on the subject of the inequities of the distribution of environmental burdens and benefits in our city for almost three decades. Thank you to the Council, the Sanitation Committee, and Chair Reynoso for the opportunity to speak up in regards to this troubling bill, Intro 2349, which purports to amend the Waste Equity Law. For decades, we have partnered with residents of environmental justice communities to fight for a more equitable solid waste management system. Our city's waste infrastructure, such as waste transfer stations and truck depots, has historically been concentrated in just three low-income communities of color, which have, for too long, borne the brunt of the resulting poor air quality, unsafe traffic, noise, odors, and vermin, with measurable repercussions for public health. Fortunately, in 2018, this council passed a landmark environmental justice law, the Waste Equity Law, to begin to remediate this injustice. I'm appearing here today because the waste equity law is in danger of being diluted and rolled back based on mere promises of upgrades and more sustainable practices. 
And even these promises do not go far enough to mitigate the harmful impacts these truck intensive waste transfer stations have had on their surrounding community. Waste facilities had almost 10 years to get into compliance with waste equity legislation, as various versions of the waste equity law were introduced in the council at least three times over eight years before finally passing into law three years ago. There were three separate hearings for these individual bills, and during each hearing, the larger goal of shifting from truck-based waste transport to rail and barge export was highlighted, and companies were put on notice that they would be rewarded if they transitioned to export by rail in advance of a law being passed. The owners of these facilities chose to wait until after the law passed, after fighting this relatively modest reform for years, and now want to appear to get with the program. At their current capacity, these facilities have failed to comply with regulations, which raises serious concerns about their ability to safely manage additional capacity. The Department of Environmental Conservation has fined Regal and placed the company under two consent orders for failing to minimize leachate and its effects and leaving unprocessed food waste on the ground as recently as 2019. Moreover, these facilities are not taking advantage of existing exemptions in the waste equity law. In their 2020 annual report, Regal Recycling reported that they sent only 6,400 tons of organic waste to a compost facility. And that's about 18 tons per day, far less than the 120 tons per day of permit capacity that Regal reserved with DSNY during the imp implementation of the waste equity law. American Recycling reported even less organics recycling, sending only about 12 tons per day to a compost facility. This minimal commitment to recycling the huge quantities of food waste and other organic material in our waste stream is a missed opportunity for the companies to expand under the existing law. So it is difficult to understand why they're asking for more and more permit capacity at this time. Milby shares the goal of transporting waste by rail. If the companies had community support with ample opportunity for meaningful engagement, a commitment to fully enclose all of the facilities operations rather than simply three sides, a concrete technical plan for construction and rail export with agreements in place to utilize the railroad and engineering plans to demonstrate the upgrades they will accomplish to the facility in less than two years of construction and an enforceable agreement of a sunset provision so that the added and restored capacity would again be slashed to the current post waste equity levels once all the construction was completed. If all of those conditions were met, then a waiver or exemption might actually be acceptable. But what they are proposing now is simply a four-year waiver from the waste equity law to allow them to have hundreds of tons of capacity restored, bringing more waste and trucks into their community based upon mere lip service that they intend to improve operations. Rather than implementing the benefits of transporting waste by, waste by rail, this bill risks undoing the progress of the past couple of years. It would create a slippery slope once we start amending our environmental justice laws to allow for one or two private, private industry act, actors to belatedly try to improve, we completely gut the force and reliability of our laws in the first place. To say nothing of the fact that our city council should not be legislating to benefit single private actors or companies. We therefore oppose this bill and urge the council to reject it and protect the waste equity law. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Natasha Bynum, followed by Meredith Sandberg Ficarelli, followed by Dominic Cusino. Good morning, everyone. My name is Natasha Bynum, and I'm a legal intern also with the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, or NILPI. Um, along with many of our community partners who are testifying here today, our organization has advocated for waste equity for decades including our longtime advocacy for the commercial waste zone law, the amending of which is the subject of this hearing today. Thank you to the Sanitation Committee and Chair Reynoso for your continued leadership on this issue and the opportunity to testify. I'm testifying on behalf of NILPI to express our support for pre-considered bill T-2021-7669, which would remove waste auditors from the definition of trade waste broker in section 501 of chapter one, title 16A of the administrative code. In doing so, we hope to underscore the importance of ensuring that the city's laws will allow emerging sustainability auditing businesses, which are largely women owned and led, to play critical and growing roles in the commercial waste zone system without having to pay a prohibitive licensing fee. While trade waste brokers negotiate deals between commercial customers and waste collectors for a fee or commission, Waste auditors serve an entirely different and environmentally responsible function in the material management economy. They service uh, and data, they, their services and data produced by waste auditors can be used 
by their generators of commercial waste to seek transparent and fair price estimates from haulers, identify opportunities for waste reduction, overall improving transparency in what the customers are paying for and resulting in increase, uh, increasing diversion rates for commercial waste sectors, a major goal of the commercial waste zone system. As the city works towards its goal of zero waste, waste auditors can and should play an integral role. However, these auditing businesses cannot flourish so long as they are mistakenly classified as waste brokers under the law. Because every business considered a waste broker must be licensed by BIC under the administrative code, small, sustainability-minded auditing businesses are required to pay prohibitively expensive licensing fees and jump through unnecessary procedural hoops. This has prevented and will continue to prevent local, sustainable, and women and minority-led businesses from playing a critical role in commercial waste management. Hindering the growth of this waste auditor startup sector undermines the sustainability and equity goals that are fundamental to the commercial waste zone law. NOPI supports removing waste auditing from the definition of waste broker and further suggests that this bill amend Title 16 Section B of the Administrative Code as well to explicitly define waste auditing such that DSNY alone has the right to certify and re regulate waste auditors. As the city continues to implement commercial waste zone systems, we want to thank our partners in DSNY and their diligent work to Time ensure expired. that these transformative systems are implemented in a way that ensures, ensures sustainability, equity, and transparency at the heart of the new commercial waste system. We'd like to again thank Chair Reynoso for continuing to work with us on waste equity issues in the city, and thank you all for your time and consideration today. Thank you. Next up is Meredith Danberg Piccarelli, followed by Dominic Cicino, followed by Chris Hines. Starting time. Good morning. My name is Meredith Danberg Ficarelli, and I am the director of Common Ground Compost LLC, a member of the Save Our Compost Coalition, a member of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board, and a board member of the US Composting Council. Through my work, I build zero waste programs, advocate for the expansion of access to waste reduction services, and center education on materials literacy, the power of individual behavioral change, and the recognition that all people must demand structural change in order to build a livable and just future for all. I'm here today to urge you to improve access to employment opportunities in the waste sector, allowing more New Yorkers to play an active role in mitigating climate catastrophe. New Yorkers need green jobs that help us curb emissions, reduce waste export, exports, produce essential soil amendments, and provide new sources of non-toxic renewable energy. One immediate way to support job creation of this kind is to pass legislation that decouples waste auditing from waste brokering. A certification course for auditors must be created, data reported to a central database, pricing mechanisms should be standardized, and businesses guided to reduce waste and recycle more. Waste work is hard work, and with greater transparency, lots can be streamlined. Waste brokering can involve the management of waste infrastructure, contracts, and bidding processes while waste auditing is the physical process of weighing bags of waste to demonstrate waste generation and identifying contamination, which can all, uh, and identifying contamination to snapshot recycling behavior. Generally, a survey is a visual assessment of waste, which can also include weighing, while an audit is a more in-depth assessment that involves weighing of all bags, sorting material, and detailing contamination in different waste streams. If you can see my Zoom photo, that's me at a waste audit in a Manhattan office building last night. Um, thanks for the early start time today, guys. Currently, in order to audit the waste generated by a business, an individual or a company must be registered by BIC as a trade waste broker, a process that requires extensive paperwork and a $5,000 application fee. Today, New York City businesses pay for waste to be collected, but the system lacks transparency and businesses are frequently confused about what exactly they're paying for. Waste bills can be based on frequency of collection of different streams, estimated weight of waste, volume or size of waste containers, real estate square footage, number of bags of waste, and other variables. Many business owners have no idea how much waste they generate or if they are paying a fair price for service. Under the current system, it is normal for haulers and waste brokers to estimate or survey waste and then set a monthly hauling price, leaving the businesses at the whim of those results, which are gathered in a non-standard manner, not always shared with the business, and no centralized database exists. 
we are missing a major opportunity to benchmark, to bring transparency to this sector and to empower businesses to better understand their waste. Commercial waste zoning will encourage more businesses to assess their waste streams through the services of third party auditors who will impartially measure waste, share the data with the city, the hauler, the business, and then the hauler, and then the hauler and the business would directly set the pricing for waste collection services. The auditors would not need to be involved in the price setting at all. New York City can begin to standardize both the metrics that are used to bill businesses for waste collection services and the procedures that are followed to collect and report this data. Benchmarking behavior through waste surveys and auditing is an essential building block to the circular economy. Until individuals and businesses understand their waste behavior, they may not recognize the opportunities that exist to save money by reducing waste and to share and donate valuable materials, repair items, and divert as much as possible from landfills and incinerators through recycling, composting, and other value recovery mechanisms. To support a new and transparent commercial waste landscape, a waste auditing certification course must be created that will train independent contractors and businesses to become certified third-party waste auditors while taking all necessary precautions to keep organized crime out of the waste industry. Best practices in waste surveys and auditing should include measuring piles of waste for length, width, and height, photographing waste as it, as it is set at the curb and or in containers, counting bags of all streams wherever possible, weighing bags and identifying contamination among other metrics. With these standardized metrics, DSNY can develop standard assumptions about waste streams across different business types and sizes and can even better oversee and enforce fair pricing. In addition to learning best practices, waste survey and audit procedures and reporting requirements, this certification course can educate about zero waste and offer these auditors a framework through which they can provide a wide array of waste reduction and behavioral change recommendations to businesses. DSNY has an opportunity to create an on-ramp to the circular economy for New Yorkers through this certification program. I'm almost done. To meet our citywide zero waste goals, we need all hands on deck. The more certified waste auditors in our communities, the more opportunities there will be for businesses to understand their waste services and what steps they can take to reduce waste. Developing a waste auditor certification program would not only facilitate green jobs creation and foster a new era of interagency collaboration for climate justice, it would increase equity and accessibility in the waste sector, give us a clearer picture of the state of waste in our city and offer an innovative opportunity to, ed to enter our city's waste sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Dominic Cicino, followed by Chris Hine, followed by Mike Reale. Starting time. Hello, guys. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to share a screen here, but I can't. So I'll just kind of tell you about the project. Uh, the goal of our project here, you know, has been to reduce traffic and remove trucks from the roadway of Queens, you know, increase air quality in the community, decrease the amount of material going to landfills, and give jobs to local community members. You know, this project has been uh, underway for about 16 years now, and three years ago we got the approval from the Long Island Railroad that they'd be willing to, you know, connect the rail spur to our project facilities. So that's, you know, why we're, you know, doing it at this point in the game. The current facility is planning on building a state-of-the-art facility that is going to be both aesthetically pleasing to the community and is going to help shield the community from the views of the, indu in the industrial park for the residents. And it's going to allow the municipal solid waste building to be modified, so that way we can increase our reduction ratios. The construction and demolition building will be re relocated, giving us the ability to build the railroad tracks on the property. The current mechanic shop we removed and converted into a storage facility for rail containers, so this way we can help improve the movement of waste by rail. The newly renovated buildings will have new air filtration systems, odor suppression equipment, and advanced dust mitigation technology. With these changes, the companies will now have the capacity capability of building two railroad tracks on the property that connect to a dead rail line located parallel to the property. 
That's part of the reason why we feel that, you know, we can complete this project within that 48 month window. The facility should be able to shield operations, public view, and help improve traffic flow on Liberty Avenue. As larger part of the project, American and Regal plan on introducing a community solar project. Uh, American Recycling is building a 70, 750,000 kilowatt system that would offset 386,000 pounds of CO2 annually. And Regal is building a 390 kilowatt system that would offset 200,000 pounds of CO2 annually. These facilities will be able to supply 1.4 million kilowatts of clean renewable energy to the local area. The combined CO2 offset just in the community solar project is greater than 585,000 pounds annually. The project would be capable of servicing both facilities and, com and commercial subscribers of 192 homes in Queens every year for the next 25 years. Regal plans on putting a live green wall directly across from the park. So this way it helps air filtration and beautify the neighborhood. American plans on putting live green walls on its facility uh, do the same. The new facility will also include a state-of-the-art classroom. We plan on inviting local schools to safety tour, to safely tour our facility. This will give the next generation an opportunity to learn the importance of recycling and taking care of the environment. They'll be able to see what exactly goes into the recycling process. This will give them an appreciation for the important steps that each person can take in the cycle and take impact. And they can learn about the exciting career opportunities that are taking place in their community. Both companies have reached out to the community, the council members, the community board and York College, and they're looking to do local hiring and participate through different programs. Remember, the goal of this project is to, to reduce truck traffic that will allow and also set a new standard for innovation and innovation in the waste management industry. We want to create a facility that the local community members are proud of, not only aesthetically, but functionally. The completed facility should allow us to shield the community from dust, noise, and uh, odors. You know, our proposed activity will eliminate 46 round trip truck trips from the Queens area to landfills around New York state. You know, we're gonna be reducing seven, from what one truck drives a day, 719 miles, which makes about 10,000 annual trips for the capacity we're gonna be able to put on the rail. So you're talking about taking, you know, but process now that takes 2000 gallons of diesel fuel a day, I'm sorry, a year, and moving it down to 400,000 gallons of diesel fuel a year. The 22,000 tons of CO2 emissions produced a year will be cut down to about 4,500 tons of CO2 a year. You know, right now there's, uh, those truck trips take about 200 tons of nitric oxide and 44.8 tons of particulate matter they put into the local community. We're going to be knocking that down to 124 tons of nitric oxide and 2.9 tons of particulate matter. So there's many benefits to this project. A lot of it is local highway congestion. You know, we're going to be removing those large trucks that are removing waste from our facilities to the upstate facilities. We're going to be removing them from the state and local roadways, mainly Liberty Avenue. Uh, this will help decrease, you know, the uh, population help the, I'm sorry, will help decrease crashes on the local highways and it will put a 10% reduction in traffic miles provides about 14.7% reduction in total crashes is gives the overall economic impact of converting to rail for the local community close to $10 million a year. Um, can we, uh, we have uh, Dominic, uh, I'm sorry. We, you know, we were we're allowing a little bit of a grace period here for folks that want to testify a little bit over the time allotted. But 
Um, you know, we just want to be respectful of the fact that we have a lot of folks that want to speak. Um, we just want to make sure that, that they get that opportunity. So if you could just wrap it up so we can go to the next person. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Yes, not a problem. I just want to emphasize that this is all about removing trucks from the roads and protecting our local communities. Thank you again. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Chris Hyam, followed by Mike Reale, followed by Demond Wilkerson. Starting time. Oh. I believe Chris Hine is with Dominic for unmuting purposes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, we're, and we just want to acknowledge you were joined by Council Member uh, Justin Brennan as well. Thank you. Am I speaking? Yeah. I just want to say thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak about the project that's been our dream for uh, many years. We went back 16 years ago and it asked uh, just for the reason of the rail was right next to the property. Hey, let's move some waste by rail and, and, and not knowing all the positives that we would learn through the 13 year process of them saying no, that I'm changing the mind of the of the rail to putting more commerce back on rail. They were taking commerce off rail for the past 15 years or so. So we've, we, we've gone out and we've done our homework. And if, if the before and after picture is gonna be dramatic uh, for the community and for, for the operations. It's not a, okay, let um, American Recycling and Regal put this uh, plan together so that we can increase our bottom line. This is probably gonna decrease our bottom line but it's gonna be longevity for us to exist with the coexisting neighborhood and better it. So other than what Dominic has said, I just, uh, I guess we'll have some answer questions and answer section after this, but I just wanna say thank you and I hope the opportunity is uh, well taken. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Mike Reale, followed by Demon Wilkerson, followed by Mary Arnold. Starting time. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Get it. Is that working now? No, Mr. Really, uh, you, you have several devices on in the same room. You may need to turn off the mic and audio on the other devices so we can hear you well. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, you're thank good, you very Mike. much. You're I good. do apologize for that. Um, I just want to say thank you again for everyone that's present and for the chair, uh, for the chair of Reynoso. Thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, all the other uh, council members that are here and everyone that's present. And as Dominic and uh, Mr. Chris Hine, as mentioned before, this has been a long road and something that we're very, very dedicated to. I'm very proud to say that I'm a a uh, long-time standing member of Southeast Queens, uh, born at Jamaica Hospital, uh, raised in uh, Jamaica, right off of Liberty and Sufton Boulevard as a young child. And that's why we have our foundation here in Queens and Southeast Queens. We've always been here. We're so proud to be part of this community. And why this is so important, this is a, a tremendous investment, not only in, in, the, in the waste industry to be a forefront, of sustainability as we're all here for. I'm also very proud to say that we are the number one recycling company in New York City commercially exporting 250 million pounds of material throughout the world, India, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, and that all comes from Southeast Queens. Composting, we wanna to continue to grow composting but in organics, but as we do, it's very difficult to try to separate and get the material clean. And that's what we've been working diligently to work with. We continue to work with the concrete metals and this all comes to fruition of everything we continue to do, make investments. And the most important part, it's labor intense. We have 
union jobs, people working daily, all local. We have hundreds of people that work here on a daily basis and we wanna to continue to grow. And that's why this is so important, not only for us, but it's, it's for the community. And as, as I can say, stated before, we have a petition sign for hundreds of people that live that we're gonna send out um, to be part of the record in the next few days that people locally have been just signed and says, hey, we were doing this project. We need your support. Thank you so much. We're here, we're part of it. And like I said before, thank you. And this is not only good for us, but this is good for everyone that's involved in New York City sanitation and recycling and for a sustainable future. That's what I've been doing my whole life. And, and that's what I wanna to continue to do. And thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Demon Wilkerson, followed by Mary Arnold, followed by Oscar Bryan. Starting time. Good morning. Um, my name is uh, Demond Wilkerson. My company is uh, Modern Community Capital. I'm a consultant on the project, specifically focused on financing. And I wanted to address some of the questions and concerns around the restoration of capacity. You know, I deal directly with the financing pieces in my company. You know, we specialize in community development financing. Um, and Chris um, from American alluded to it earlier that ultimately this is a very expensive project. And it, in honest, all honesty, is not necessarily going to increase the bottom line because of that. The types of funding programs and financing strategies that we had to put in place are going to, you know, the, 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 the lenders that have kind of a dual underwriting mechanism, where they're looking at the economics, but ultimately they're also looking at social impact metrics as well, like job creation. Is it a catalytic investment for the community to spur other investment happening in the community? Is it reducing the carbon footprint? And a number of other, you know, items that we're going to be held liable to from the funding sources. And so, you know, the, um, you know, the restoration of capacity is, you know, you know, the ability for the underwriters to look at the debt service ability, capability of the companies to support the project. And it, it does put a heavy burden on that ability once when the, uh, you know, we had the, the reduction in, um, in capacity because we started this process well over two years ago. So I can speak directly, you know, as an outside consultant dealing with the financing that it, it does make it extremely challenging based on, you know, the, 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 the goals of, of the organizations and the, the great, you know, um, you know, the, the size of the investment that they're looking to put into the project, looking at creating more of a catalyst, you know, for future development. And really, I think from my perspective, putting forth, you know, based on, you know, some of the questions, concerns, and Council Member Miller, you know, we definitely thank you for your input. He wanted to, to have, you know, something that was going to be long lasting within the community. And so they put together a very lofty proposal and to, to finance that, you know, it is a very big a lift and a, and a heavy challenge. You know, I'd be happy to take questions and things like that offline, but I just wanted to uh, just kind of make that statement on behalf of the, the financing side of things. So I thank you for your time. Thanks. Um, next will be Mary Arnold, followed by Oscar Bryan, followed by Mary Perez and Lavelle. Starting time. I am speaking today on behalf of Civics United for Railroad Environmental Solutions, CURES, and at the request of constituents of Councilman Miller. CURES is not against the use of freight rail or waste by rail in areas that already see freight rail, are zoned for heavy industry, and meet the same standards that the New York City Department of Sanitation set for waste management. These standards include fully enclosed facilities with pollution controls, sealed containment of waste in rail cars, the use of modern tier four near zero emissions locomotives and direct shipment of waste. Other private companies in this new industry have already proven that they will conduct their business in ways that do not protect the health and quality of life of New Yorkers. To speak to Councilman Renozo's questions and Deputy Commissioner Anderson's point, 
All other waste by rail today uses high polluting, noisy 1970 locomotives that were grandfathered out of the Federal Clean Air Act so they can be used indefinitely. See, construction and demolition debris operations take place in buildings with three walls and a roof, which is not an enclosed facility and means open air waste processing that emits waste blow off leachate and odors in communities. Uh, this law would allow 51% shipment only of rail and the use and legitimizes the use of such facilities. C&D is shipped in open rail cars that emit waste blow off leachate and odors. They ship overfilled rail cars with muffin top loads that have been involved in derailments that delayed commuter trains. They regularly mix stinky petrusable waste with construction debris in open rail cars. To speak to Dominic Cicino's points, on a Sunday, Curious board members observe Long Island Railroad moves on the track he describes as dead. There is no freight rail there. They have presented on-site renderings of the proposed facility and never provided promised follow-up documentation on the serious and costly grade separation and space constraint issues that are barriers to rail. To speak to Deputy Commissioner Anderson's and Councilman Miller's points, you should insist on cleaning up waste by rail technology in New York State before changing Local Law 152, because if you advance this legislation, you will not be able to control the resulting adverse interjurisdictional impacts. The Long Island Railroad refused to participate in the New York City Economic Development Corporation DERA grant for waste management's locomotive. The Long Island Railroad has received $27 million since 2013 to get rid of the 1970s locomotive. Time expired. And has had an open RFP that was supposed to do this since 2018. And yet all the Long Island Railroad has to report on their progress is that they can't talk about it. The New York State Department of Environmental Conservation has turned a blind eye to adverse community impacts in New York City during its industry-driven siloed site-by-site -site expansion of waste by rail, including in environmental justice communities, left rail containment standards out of the Part 360 regulations. And they did this despite powers given by the Federal Clean Railroads Act, which took powers over transfer stations away from the Federal Service Transportation Board. The Federal Railroad Administration has no jurisdiction over this type of solid waste. In setting waste by rail standards more than 10 years ago, the Department of Sanitation was being responsive to community advocacy. And they knew that even with these mitigations, waste by rail comes with significant community burdens. Wherever there are waste by rail transfer and transload stations, there are more trucks. Waste will still come to transfer stations by trucks, even with direct rail. And more tonnage means more trucks. New York City laws limiting noise, hours of operation, and idling do not apply to railroads, and most operations take place at night. Since 2008, when the waste by rail industry began in the New York City region, private fortunes have been made without mitigating public costs. The trains in the M1 zone are powered by electricity. It would be unconscionable for the Sanitation Committee to approve this heavy industrialization in an M1 zone or any other neighborhood of New York City that doesn't already have freight rail. It would be unconscionable to industrialize and degrade quality of life in New York City neighborhoods just to export waste at a time when zero waste and composting at scalar city goals and environmental justice neighborhoods are owed tonnage relief through the new waste equity law. Intro 2349 sets lower standards for waste by rail than the waste equity law and the standards waste management had to meet. The proposed legislation opens a Pandora's box of increased tonnage, lowered standards, and community harms, not just for one environmental justice community in Queens, but for environmental justice communities across the city. It legitimizes unenclosed transfer stations that have three walls and a roof that will emit waste blow off leachate and odors. 
It only requires 51% rail shipment, so the rest by truck. It facilitates the use of inappropriate sites for waste by rail and the use of city streets to truck waste from transfer stations to transload facilities. There are traffic and public safety issues this law fails to address. Queens and Brooklyn have freight rail grade crossings with primitive crossing protection, where trains already block city streets during freight rail moves. There have been truck freight locomotive crashes at such crossings since 2015. This legislate, what we need is regional solid waste management planning for waste by rail. And we need planning for, to achieve zero waste goals, as Eric Goldstein said. This law, not this law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Withdraw this, please. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Officer Brian, followed by Mary Harrison Lavelle, followed by Rebecca Brodsky. Starting time. Uh, thank you. My name is Oscar Bryan, president of St. Albans Civic Improvement Association and uh, just a regular citizen in the community. Um, I want to remember where we started, how we got here. For years, citizens in the community have complained about the stench that it emits from these waste transfer stations. I mean, you can smell it from blocks away. Now, if I hadn't seen with my own two eyes what proper waste transfer stations can look like when we, the sites visits to uh, Disney locations, uh, department sanitation locations, I went inside those waste transfer stations. I can't smell garbage. In this area, a residential, people live feet away. This, uh, this uh, waste transfer station is actually in people's, you can see it from someone's backyards uh, along the other, the other street there. You can literally, so we're talking about stench in the area. So that's what we were trying to mitigate. Uh, here we are now, uh, we're talking about this waste by rail, and uh, there's supposed to be, uh, which I didn't see in the legislation, any requirements that they cover or, or mitigate that smell. It's not in the legislation. I heard a lot of promises here. I didn't see it in paper. <clears throat> we're talking a lot about the effects of the waste transfer stations, and we're not talking about the effects on the people. The people come first. They're, they're the ones who are most impacted. Uh, you know, Malcolm X said something to the effect that, that you don't stick a knife in a man's back six inches and pull it out three and call it progress. Well, we're doing it's worse here because we're actually sticking it in six inches and sticking it in two more inches because you're expecting these people to deal with this for four more years. And everyone's talking about waste by rail transfer and Sister Arnold's correct. You're talking about increasing it for four more years when they've been dealing with this problem for decades. I'm not sure if that's just as children are developing asthma in this area. There's a public park which was recognized that people can't barely use, right? I mean, we're talking about people and human and children, all right? We're talking about uh, the ability of an organization uh, to quote unquote increase their facilities when they or improve their facilities when they haven't shown to be good characters or good community partners in the past and we're expecting us to trust that they'll do this now. Uh, fool me once, shame on, <laughs> shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, all right? Um, the, the uh, and there's and there's rumors again. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, there are a contingency plan to maintain the truck traffic just in case waste by rail falls through. So I'm not quite sure if that exists out there. I could be wrong. Then I'm not quite sure if you're functioning as true community partners, and therefore I say reject 2349. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Mary Preez and Lavelle, followed by Rebecca Brodsky, followed by Andrea Scarborough. Starting time. Good morning. My name is Mary Parison Lavelle. I'm the president of Civics United for Railroad Environmental Solutions, CURES. I'm speaking out against Councilman Miller's legislation. Constituents of Councilman Miller's district are being told that a new state of art waste transfer station will be built and waste will be transported with a new rail siding so that they can get trucks off the roads. Things look great on paper until they're actually implemented. These people were supposed to get some relief from tonnage decreases in their communities through the waste equity law. So instead, this law increases tonnage, legitimizes transfer stations with three walls and a roof and doesn't require direct rail or sealed containment of waste. 
the odors, as people have testified today, are horrendous. These are lower standards than the Department of Sanitation set for waste management. The proposed law will not get rid of trucks and will add the problems of outmoded waste by rail to their current problems. Why is that? Because the operations of the New York and Atlantic Railway are noisy and high polluting. They use, as Mary Arnold stated, 1970 locomotives to haul waste. Construction and demolition debris is hauled in open rail cars that emit waste, blow off, leachate, and odors. Waste by rail, as we know, is a big business. The way waste by rail is being conducted today, it's profitable for the private industries at the expense of the health and quality of life for the communities like ours through their rail car travels. Before there is any expansion of this waste by rail industry, the industry must invest in new technologies and government must establish standards that end needless health and quality of life harms in communities already burdened with growing amounts of waste by rail. Regional solid waste management and transportation planning are needed to clean up waste by rail and thoughtfully consider how it should work in conjunction with citywide composting, recycling, and reuse. This faulty legislation proliferates current problems and creates new ones. Please protect those you serve and do the right thing by withdrawing this legislation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Rebecca Braskby, followed by Andrea Scarborough, followed by Walter Dugan. Starting time. Good morning. My name is Rebecca Bradspees. I'm a professor at CUNY School of Law, where I run the Center for Urban Environmental Reform, known as CURE. I sit on the New York City Environmental Justice Advisory Committee and on EPA's Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee. My testimony today is based on CURE's work with the Jamaica residents who recruited our assistance to combat the noise, odor, and dust nuisances created by the waste transfer stations in their neighborhood. We are therefore stunned that this committee is entertaining introduction 2349, which would gut local law 152, the waste equity bill, vis-a-vis -vis this community. In the process, this introduction would inflict new additional noise, odor, and dust burdens on an already overburdened community. I urge this committee to make sure that all of the city's waste handling laws promote rather than undermine waste equity. I'd like to take the opportunity to remind the committee that pursuant to local laws 60 and 64 of 2017, the environmental justice laws, New York City recently released its map of environmental justice neighborhoods. I urge this committee to explicitly prioritize reducing environmental burdens on the city's newly delineated environmental justice communities, including the part of Jamaica Queens that the waste transfer stations benefited by this bill are located. I also want to remind this committee that environmental justice requires not only the fair distribution of environmental burdens and benefits across the city, but also that affected communities have the opportunity to participate meaningful in the public decision processes by which environmental choices are made. This legislation achieves neither goal. Instead, this bill adds significant new environmental burdens to an already overburdened community and does so with nothing resembling meaningful notice and consultation. New York City has long recognized that meaningful participation must occur at a time that allows community occur concerns to be considered in environmental decision making and must involve the opportunity for affected community members to contribute information, ask questions, and share their perspectives with decision makers. Communication that flows one way from decision makers to communities informing them about decisions made elsewhere based on uncommunicated priorities is not meaningful participation. Processes that give the veneer of public participation without actually allowing any opportunity for affected individuals to share their concerns or influence decisions undermine public trust in government and impoverish public discourse. With that critical reminder about the role meaningful uh, public participation plays in legitimating public decision-making, I'd like to tell you a brief story. 
Stuart had spent the last year collaborating with community groups in Jamaica, Queens, a designated environmental justice community under both state and local law. At the request of community members, CURE has been assisting them gather information with regard to the laws and regulations governing the waste transfer stations in the neighborhood. These waste transfer stations are inappropriate located in an M1 fire. zone, oops, directly adjacent to a public park and a residential neighborhood. And it's obviously one of the uh, neighborhoods that waste equity was intended to um, benefit. Um, this introduction is the culmination of an ongoing process that was conducted with no community involvement whatsoever. Although elected officials were apparently writing letters of support for the expansion as soon as the waste equity law passed in 2018, the affected community learned about this for the first time on April 14, 2021, exactly one day before the so-called public meeting on the proposal on April 15, 2021. That meeting is a so-called public meeting because although there was a poster announcing the meeting, it wasn't actually posted anywhere in the community, either physically or virtually. The meeting was not included in any newsletter, including Council Member Miller's weekly email that came out on April 9th, nor was it posted on the community board website. The poster announcing this meeting made its way to Facebook only the afternoon before the meeting, and the community owes its knowledge of that April 14th so-called meeting to this committee which seems to have been the only recipient of the poster and promptly shared it with the community. During the period between the fall of 2018 to the present, there was no public outreach, no stakeholder consultation, no opportunity for meaningful involvement in this momentous decision that will impose significant impacts on this community. There was no opportunity for any form of direct public participation at that April 15th meeting either. The presenters were identified by first name only, provided no contact information and no opportunity for follow-up. Questions could be submitted only through Zoom and the few questions that were proposed to the presenters were paraphrased rather than read aloud. To my certain knowledge, substantive questions were neither posed nor answered. Requests for the video of this recorded meeting, the attendee list, the questions submitted, remain unanswered. Council Member uh, Miller's uh, office informed us that the, that data is wholly in the custody of the waste transfer station. The waste transfer station has not responded to emails or phone calls. Not only is this a breach of the open meetings law, it is yet another environmental injustice inflicted on this community. I urge you to keep environmental justice at the center of your work. That means keeping meaningful community participation at the center of your work. This community deserves to be consulted, to be listened to, to have a genuine opportunity to participate in this momentous decision. Therefore, I urge you not to take any action on introduction 2349 until that consultation occurs. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Andrea Scarborough, followed by Walter Deegan, followed by Gary Giordano. Andrew, I think you muted, you unmuted and muted. I apologize for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Clock Good is morning. ready. Good morning, Chairman Reynoso, Council Member Danique Miller, and all of the panel. My name is Andrea Scarborough. I am the former president of Addisley Park Civic Organization and most recently voted as the vice chair of the Queen's Solid Waste Advisory Board. I am speaking here today, however, as a concerned resident of Southeast Queens District 12. I oppose intro 2349 for the following reasons. The proposed legislation is seeking to grant the facilities American recycling, regal recycling, and increasing their protressable waste based on their intent to move to a rail system and not their current operational practices. Although these facilities are not named in the legislation, the civic leaders, um, of District 12 attended presentations by Council Member Miller and the two waste transfer stations where this project was presented. Why would a city law give permission to waste facilities to infringe upon a community's quality of life by removing an existing cap and um, allowing more tonnage of waste for four years based on their word intent to move to exporting waste through the rail system, that is unacceptable. History has shown 
that Regal Royal Recycling cannot be depended upon to honor their commitments. In 2002-2003, a stipulation of settlement between the waste facility and several advocacy groups allowed the company to increase its capacity for processing protressable solid waste from 177 tons to 600 tons per day. In return, they agreed to several conditions, including preparing quarterly compliance reports to be sent to the Federation of Civic Associations and Community Board 12. Regal was also to designate an in-house point person to receive and respond to complaints from the community whose name and telephone number was to be provided to the community and to the executive board of the Federation of Civic Associations, as well as Community Board 12. None of these conditions were ever met. With the exception of one other waste transfer station, Southeast Queens District 12 is the only area in all of New York City where a waste station has been allowed to operate in an M1 zoned area, a zone designed to accommodate light manufacturing, not heavy industrial use activity. These stations are poorly run. They need to improve their management. We have homeowners that are subject to facilities that pollute the air, expose residents to stench, and create an unhealthy condition for everyone that lives there. Intro 2349 fails to make the case for allowing more waste into a community where by law, it does not belong. Finally, understanding uh, that increase waste means increased trucks coming in creating the very environmental condition that you're trying to rectify. Finally, at the Zoom presentation by American Regal Recycling, it was stated that their intent was to one, build a new facility at their site, two, export their waste by the rail system, and three, request a removal of their existing cap and increase their waste capacity. Intro 2349 legislation that is before the Sanitation Committee, however, excludes the building of a new facility, something very important to the community. Should this legislation pass, the waste transfer station potentially would be allowed to increase their waste without ever being held accountable to build a new facility or address the inefficiencies that exist at their site without ever being held accountable to improve the quality of life for the residents that live by these two waste transfer stations. As a concerned resident of Southeast Queens, I ask that intro 2349 be rejected. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up will be Walter Dogan, followed by Gary Giordano, followed by Lou Scale. Clock is ready. Good morning, City Council. My name is Walter Dogan. I'm the president of Brinker Health Action Association, the adjacent city to where we're talking about. I ask that the council please reject intro 2349 for the following reasons. Southeast Queens District 12 has been identified as an environmental justice community. The goal is to get to zero waste. Any consideration on increase in waste defeats this purpose. The locations of these proposals are in already overburdened in one zone with buildings that were grandfathered in. The area will suffer an increase in pollution because it will require an increase in the number of trucks coming into and going out of the neighborhood. This law offers blankish tonnage for them to bring in. The residents of the community are suffering and will continue to suffer more because they are unable to enjoy the comforts of their homes year round. The council should not be providing loopholes to increase more tonnage of waste coming into a community. It is inappropriate when zero waste is the goal. This was not the intent of the waste equity law. 
There have been no plans shared, no answers given. All right. No, no plans shared, no answers given, provided the question posed by the community about this project. The residents live in the area has not been considered in a meaningful way. Councilman Miller's law, proposed law, legitimized under closed transfer, unenclosed transfer station with three walls and a roof. Please consider our families who have suffered and will continue to suffer from this legislation. Please withdraw this legislation. Please take your time to reject intro three, two, three, four, nine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Gary Giordano, followed by Luis Gale, followed by Reverend Dr. Phil Craig. Clock is ready. Hi, good, uh, good morning. My name is Gary Giordano. I'm the district manager of Community Board 5 in Queens. Um, thank you for uh, conducting this hearing. Councilman Reynoso, it's good to see you, even if it's remote. I wish you all the best um, and hopefully congratulations. Uh, I really feel for those people in Jamaica who could see a 20% or more increase in activity at the waste transfer station. Waste in New York City is a tremendous problem that I think we really need to get more of a handle on. Um, and that involves being able to recycle more, especially with construction and demolition debris, in my opinion. So an environmental justice community, no doubt Jamaica is that, no doubt portions of Board 1 in Brooklyn are that, also portions of District 5 in Queens, in my opinion, are that. Because all of the freight, or almost all of the freight that comes by rail into Long Island has to come into Glendale in District 5, Queens. And it's sorted there in the middle of the night. If you think freight rail is something uh, that's a, an innocent use or completely and utterly better than trucks, it puts a lot of pressure on specific communities. And it's nice to talk about freight rail, but basically all that freight rail is going on that uh, uh, Long Island Railroad line that in our area, it's the Montauk line and the Montauk West line that is bringing everything into Q5, basically. Um, and that includes putrescible garbage, construction and demolition debris, you name it. If it's going out of New York City, it almost all has to come through Q5. Um, so freight rail capacity issues are a tremendous problem. Talk about, oh yeah, use freight rail, use freight rail. There aren't too many freight lines available. In fact, it's mainly one that goes all the way from Sunset Park and then you know uh, along the Montauk line and then back up with the, uh, the CSX line over the Hellgate Bridge. That's everything. Um, we have to find ways. I understand the, the desire to move freight by rail, but we have to find ways to, to do this um, with covering the rail cars that have the C and D debris. That's absolutely critical. Um, I think the city council has to push the state of New York to mandate that because you have all this particulate matter um, blowing off these rail cars when they're traveling uh, upstate, usually to cross the Hudson. Um, and that's, you know, basically a, a, a pollutant that it's a silent pollutant. And then the noise all night long for these poor people that live along the rail line where the operation can't be during the day. More of those operations have to take place uh, during the day. There's no doubt about that. And then the polluting locomotives. The, uh, the state legislature has approved $27 million, as I think one of the ladies from Cure said, uh, to, buy, to buy, I'll end in a quickly, to buy new locomotives. Not that New York and Atlantic Railway is going to buy them. Not that the Long Island Railroad is going to buy them. Our state tax dollars had to be approved to buy these locomotives because nobody else has taken responsibility. Now the Long Island Railroad is jerking around for lack of a better term, because they don't want to get, in my opinion, the least polluting locomotives uh, because it doesn't meet their, their own needs uh, outside of the freight rail operation. 
You know, you want switcher locomotives. They only want to buy long haul locomotives. So this is a complex issue. And I think that this bill is very unwise and should be rejected because it's going to put more pressure on the entire system beginning in Jamaica and then all along the route of the freight rail. It's not just Jamaica and Glendale, all along the route of the freight rail and those pollutants going into these communities because those rail cars don't have to be covered and those and, and the locomotives don't have to be upgraded. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Luis Gael, followed by Reverend Dr. Phil Craig, followed by Camille Morgan. Clock is ready. Good morning, everybody. My name is Luz Gell, and I would like to thank this committee for the opportunity to provide expert testimony on the proposed legislation. The proposed legislation is seeking to grant two waste transfer stations in District 12, American and Regal, an increase in patriciable waste based on their intent to move to waste by rail. We urge you to oppose the proposed amendment, intro 2349, to the waste equity law that would allow these facilities to increase their permitted waste capacity for export by rail. We are a team of physicians, industrial hygienists, epidemiologists, scientists, and community-engaged research from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai with expertise in environmental and public health. Our team has extensive expertise and experience in counseling communities and families on evidence-based strategies to create safer environments. We are convinced that the proposed amendment will have long-lasting toxic impacts on the children living near the site as well as their, their families. As health professionals with expertise on the impacts of environment on health, we oppose the amendment for the following two reasons. The first one, added environmental health inequities. Allowing these waste transfer stations to increase their permitted waste capacity could disproportionately expose the neighboring community to increased environmental hazards, such as air quality, odor, leachate, noise, and stormwater runoff. The second reason, environmental justice. Number one reason, way these waste, waste transfer stations are meant to operate an M3 zone heavy industrial use area. And of course, these uh, facilities are inappropriately located in an M1 zone directly adjacent to a public park in a residential neighborhood. Also, there has been no meaningful attempt to directly involve community members in the decision making process of the proposed waste, uh, waste transfer station expansion. Allowing these facilities to expand will set precedent for other environmental justice communities across New York City to become industrialized. When it comes to environmental health inequities, we know that they are too, far too prevalent in New York. And too often these health hazards are placed unjustly and distributed in, in, in place in low-income communities of color that contribute to health effects and burdens. As public health researchers, we see the long-term impact of environmental injustices and the role they play in affecting the health of frontline communities, which are too often low-income communities of color. For the past year, our environmental health researchers team have been collaborating on an air quality study with residents and community groups in Southeast Queens. Residents who live neither, near the two waste transfer stations have reported a high frequency of foul odors, diesel exhaust, waste blow off, leachate, constant noise, and disruption from these facilities and trucks that traverse through them on a daily basis. These exposures have a substantial impact on chronic stress, headaches, and will have long-term impacts, particularly in children living near the community. Allowing these facilities to expand their waste tonnage will worsen air quality impacts, increase odor exposures, and add to existing environmental health inequities. For example, when it comes to odor, in the summer, the stench emanating from these waste transfer facilities is so unbearable that residents are unable to open their window or use their backyard. Odor from municipal waste is primarily caused by volatile organic compounds, VOCs. And many of these compounds are known to negatively impact the health of community members. And this excessive exposure to certain VOCs has been linked to cancer, as well as damage to kidneys, liver, central nervous system, and respiratory system issues. This community is already exposed to disproportionate levels of environmental pollutants compared to high income white neighborhoods across New York City. And this impact is undeniable as chronic stress and the associated economic impact of nearby toxic waste facilities affects all aspects of life and the health of community members. In New York City, waste transfer stations are all almost exclusively located in environmental justice areas. Expanding these waste transfer facilities only deepens the environmental injustices faced by Jamaica residents and widens environmental inequities. Environmental I'm justice sure. means those most affected by environmental issues should be at the forefront of decision making. Allowing these facilities to move forward with the waste by rail undermines the waste equities laws environmental justice mandate and assists these waste transfer stations in the expansion process. 
These waste transfer stations are meant to operate in M3 heavy industrial zone. Yet again, they are inappropriately located in N1 directly adjacent to a public park and residential neighborhood. Additionally, District 12 is one of the four overburdened communities of color that waste equity law is meant to protect from additional waste handling burdens. Allowing more waste into an environmental justice neighborhood would set a precedent for other environmental justice communities across New York City to further industrialize and increase waste ex export, which goes against the city's zero waste and environmental justice goals. It is unjust to allow these facilities to bring in more waste into a neighborhood that is already facing environmental racism. The health and well being of communities should be prioritized over the interests of polluting waste facilities. I ask this committee to please withdraw this amendment and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Reverend Dr. Phil Craig, followed by Camille Morgan, followed by Indira Girasankar. Mark is ready. Yes, good morning, all. Yeah. Yes, good morning, all. Uh, peace and blessings. Um, my name is Reverend Dr. Phil Craig, and I am the senior pastor at the Greater Springfield Community Church. I have lived in Southeast Queens all my life, and also most of my congregation resides in Southeast Queens. Uh, the area of the facilities in Southeast Queens that which we are speaking about has not even had a facelift in decades. The streets uh, in that area need repair. Um, New York City has neglected to fix these roads and the sewer issues for decades that have gone by, by with, without any type of, of uh, uplift or, or any type of improvement. Um, and of course, these environmental issues will be exacerbated because of this situation. We have to start making progress for our community. I have been advocating in this community uh, ever since uh, my pastor, Reverend Dr. Floyd Flake, uh, has placed me to be his community liaison. I have taken a special interest in this community. And, and therefore, I am speaking here today in support of intro 2349, because it is time for some progress in our communities to actually happen. We do a lot of talking. We have had a lot of pushback. Uh, I have the opportunity to hear about the proposed plan to move garbage out of the community by rail. And I do believe that it is a better idea than what it is or what how it's being moved right now. I'm also happy to hear about the proposed project that uh, will have an educational component um, and it will actually teach our next generation of children uh, about what recycling is about. This is our future. This is what we should be talking about. Uh, we don't have a current resource in our schools like this in our community. Uh, I've heard uh, some pushback in the noise about this project, but much of the noise is not coming from the people who live here or work here. Much of the noise is coming from people who really is out of the community. And that's something that I really don't understand. And so while I can appreciate the concerns that people will have and others will have, um, it is not time to let our, our drive come from outside of the community. We need to have our drive from within. And um, listen, my children live here. I live here. I work here. I advocate here. My parishioners live here. They work here. They advocate here. And they deserve progress. We, can, we cannot continue to allow people to want or say about everything about our community rather than what we're saying about ourselves. And so therefore, I urge you to support Intro 2349. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Camille Morgan, followed by Indira Girasankar, followed by Dr. Maria Hubbard. Mark is ready. Good morning, everyone. I want to say thank you to all of you for the opportunity to, to speak. I myself was also growing up in the Southeast Queens area. I played on Jamaica Avenue. I remember the bakery. I remember what Jamaica Avenue and that Southeast Queens area looked like before we started having a lot of these major changes that have done something to our carbon imprint. So with that being said, what are we gonna do to fix that? 
everybody from outside of the committee wants to talk about what's not right about this proposal, but no one's talking about what's good about this proposal because it's something trying to fix an issue that is an ongoing issue that the community is aware of. You know, it's, it's strange that a lot of these outside parties have said that, you know, they've heard from the community, they've heard from the community, and I haven't heard from them. I don't know about anybody else, but that they haven't reached out to everybody in the community because I run an organization that has over 250 families and no one in my organization was contacted by any outside agency to ask them what their opinion was. But we were very well aware of what this issue was. We brought our concerns to the people who we thought could do something and they're trying to do something about it. I think it's very unfair that we're discussing today the problems with one company when the problem is generating from more than one entity in that area. The fact that these that Royal and Regal and American are willing to step up and try to do something about what's happening in our community is something that we need to commend, not sit here and try to pick apart something they're trying to do to make the community better. I thank you guys for your time. I, I, I support this, this ruling. I hope that you guys push this through because at least it's an option. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Indira Girasankar, followed by Dr. Maria Hubbard, followed by William Scarborough. Talk is ready. Good morning, Chairman Reynoso, Council Member Miller, and the rest of the members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak before you. Good morning. My name is Indira Girasankar, and I am a business owner not very far away from the proposed project in Southeast Queens. I have been a business owner in Southeast Queens for several years. I am here to speak in favor of intro 2349. I think this project will be a benefit to our community by allowing waste to be transported by rail as opposed to on the roads. I am also in favor of the area getting a much needed facelift in this climate, there aren't many companies that are willing to make the type of investment needed to improve the facilities and create educational resources for our children. Our community could also use another dose of good paying jobs, particularly during this time of economic recovery. We should support progress, but we don't have to sacrifice our environment. I believe this bill will allow a fair balance and making sure that Southeast Queens is not overburdened by trash and allow innovative ways for trash removal from our neighborhoods. Without the passage of this bill, the area will not get the upgrade that we so deserve. I have also worked with these companies and I have seen them work to create a true partnership with the communities. And I believe they will do so even more. I urge you to support intro 2349. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next up is Dr. Maria Hubbard, followed by William Scarborough. Talk is ready. Good morning, Chairman, Ren Chairman Renoso, Councilmember Miller, and the rest of the members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak before you. My name is Dr. Maria Hubbard, and I am the CEO of Agape Bethel CDC. I'm here to testify in favor of intro 2349 and to urge the members of the council to vote for this bill. This bill will allow two companies in Southeast Queens to upgrade their facilities and move garbage out of our community by rail instead of by trucks. I understand that moving garbage by rail and not by trucks is better for the environment because it reduces the amount of miles traveled on our roads, which is in dire need of repairs. I also support this project because there is supposed to be an environmental classroom that will be a part of the design. This will allow our children to learn about recycling. I think this will be tremendously beneficial to our youth and our communities in terms of education and job creation. I have personally worked with these companies in our community for 17 years. 
They have displayed good character and have proved to be trustworthy. They have a history of working with the community to do whatever they can for our residents and nonprofits. Since the shutdown and throughout the pandemic, over 42,000 boxes of food were distributed in Southeast Queens by my organization to families in need. This was made possible because of these two companies who helped pay the truck rental bills. Without these two companies, many seniors, struggling families, and especially undocumented families will have starved during the pandemic. I have numerous testimony of how they have helped our organization with taking care of fire victims to hired individuals released from prison. But back to intro 2349. I'm, I now understand why this bill is needed as it will allow the companies to generate the revenue necessary to fund the upgrades for the facility. From what I've heard, this project will require a significant financial investment. We cannot expect these companies to be able to do better for our communities when we tie their hands and make it impossible for them to fund the upgrades that we want to see happen in our community. I thank you for taking this time to listen. And again, I urge you to support 2349. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be William Scarborough. Clock is ready. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Reynoso, Council Member Miller, Council Members, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is William Scarborough. I'm a lifelong resident of Southeast Queens, uh, the Vice President of the Addisley Park Civic Organization, and a former State Assemblyman uh, covering the area in question. I'm here to uh, request that this committee do not uh, accept Intro 2349 as it is written. Uh, this area, as you know, is an M1 zone. Uh, it is one of the few areas in which a waste transfer station is allowed to exist in an M1 zone, which is supposed to coexist with residences. Uh, notwithstanding the admitted efforts of uh, Mike Reale and uh, Royal to interact with the community, by its nature, this type of uh, business is going to be a tremendous burden on their, their neighbors. The city recognized this in 2004 by uh, promulgating uh, rules that say that these types of facilities could no longer be established in an M1 zone uh, such as this. Uh, we have been engaged in a 20 year effort to uh, mitigate the impacts of this, uh, uh, this business in Southeast Queens. Uh, because of its closeness to, uh, to residences. Back in um, 2014, the uh, uh, College Point uh, Marine Transfer Station was open with the intent of easing the, uh, the, bene uh, the burdens on the Southeast Queens, on Liberty Avenue uh, and, and these areas. That did not happen, uh, the burden continues. Finally, there was some relief through the waste equity bill and the commercial waste zone. And now just as that relief is about to be realized, uh, we're being asked to re remove that and go back to allowing these, uh, the in -truck, increase of trucks and to allow this um, to, to not be uh, mitigated. I would say that uh, there must be guardrails that will allow this to go forward, but there must be a, a uh, they should be able to, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> in order for this to go forward, there has to be a guarantee that this will be able to be done. It should not be uh, go forward based on intent. The, uh, the waste equity law says that the uh, mitigation can take place if the location is operating by rail. Uh, this is being asked to uh, go forward based on the intent to, go for, uh, to do that. If they are not able to get funding, if anything goes wrong, uh, there are no guardrails for three years. The community will be forced to accept this increase in truck traffic for three years before anything can be done. This legislation I'm, should be reconsidered so that there are protections for the community. We would love to see the new facility. We would love to see waste uh, uh, by rail, but there must be protection to show that this community will not receive this burden and then not receive the benefits. Thank you. Thank you. 
That concludes everyone who has signed up to testify. Um, if we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to be called on, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be called on in the order that your hand has been raised. We don't see any hands, so I'll turn it back over to Chair Reynoso to ask questions or offer any closing remarks. Yeah, are there any council members that wish to ask any questions? Um, also, please raise your hand so the committee council will call on you. Um, just want to say thank you to everyone that has taken the time to come today. We moved the meeting up an hour earlier, and to have this turnout um, really is meaningful. Uh, I've listened to a lot of testimony today and we'll take it all into consideration as we move forward um, with the subject, with the, the legislation. Um, uh, I hope the rest of my colleagues were on and also listened to the testimony um, and wanna thank everybody for taking the time again to be here today. Um, and with that, uh, we will be uh, adjourning or concluding this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>